Okay. Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar on EPC contracts and NEC. Can we get the screen up, Rahan? Excellent. Now we now have the full webinar with the screens as well. Sorry for the delay in coming in. Um, for some reason, the, it was uh, a bit slow in loading all the participants in. I think there's still one or two still joining us, so we're going to make a start anyway. So, introductions. I am Peter Higgins, uh, Chairman of the NEC4 Contract Board, and I'm joined today by Shai Jackson, a partner at Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner. We're going to go through the uh, details of uh, EC, EPC contracts and how they work with NEC. Now, the agenda, the topics we're going to cover, a uh, little bit of introduction, really, this is what we're doing now. Shai will then talk about EPC contract. What is the, what is an EPC contract? Trying to explain how it is and how it works with NEC. I'll, I'll deal with the design and risk allocation under the NEC contract and how that works with EPC. Shai will then deal with payment and I'll cover time management. We'll then do, we'll then deal with testing and defects and operational stage under um, NEC. And Shai will explain about this approach on EPCM, a uh, little bit of a late stage involvement in after the work is complete. We should leave about 20 minutes for questions, I think. Um, there's a little tab at the bottom of the screen, which allows you to put your questions in. Just uh, click on that tab, type your question. We'll pick those up later in the seminar, later in the webinar, and hopefully deal with all the questions. Um, if there's some left over, we may be able to just send out a note covering the remaining ones afterwards. So let's start. Um, what is an EPC contract? Over to you, Shai. Um, thank you, Peter. And good morning to everyone. We thought it would be useful to start with a bit of an explanation because it will tell us how such contracts have been traditionally procured, but also give us the background as to how we can use NEC and what we're trying to achieve. Now, I recognize that some people may be very familiar with EPC contracts, so we'll keep it relatively short, but it is really for the benefit of those who have less experience of such contracts. They come in many different forms. They apply to many types of projects. I've seen NEC contracts being used on them. FIDIC has the silver book, and we also come across many bespoke versions being used all for EPC contracts. And I think a bit of a general reminder before we start is that like with any project, you need to decide what you're trying to do first, what's the delivery strategy, risk allocation, payment structure, and then choose the appropriate contract form, not do it the other way around. So EPC, in very simple terms, you can think of it as a more extreme version of design and build. The idea is that you have a turnkey contract where the client effectively tells the contractor what they want um, done and they expect to be able to switch it on once they come in when the works are complete. And in reality, it's not always quite so simple, but when we look at some of the key features of EPC contracts, how they're not quite the same as normal design and build, well, the first thing is really, there's a much higher risk transfer, the less clients involvement in the design, clients take less responsibility for initial client designs or information, and usually the contractor will take risks such as ground conditions or existing assets. In terms of single point responsibility, this is very similar to design and build, gives the client the ability to raise all the issues against the contractor who is solely responsible for the works. Payment is always an important part of any project. And almost always what we see is a fixed fee. And to a large extent, this is driven by the fact that many EPC contracts are part of a larger project finance transaction. And when funders are involved, they want as much certainty as possible, which is why they usually require a fixed fee as well as a complete tra risk transfer. And what we sometimes refer to it as Every arrangement has to be bankable, which simply means that funders have to be comfortable with how it is structured and the risk levels before they finance it. And then the other thing which is different is that you have an outcome-based specification. That usually, because such projects usually involve some complex processing, 
the ultimate goal is usually generating a revenue. So the success of the project very much depends on being able to start commercial operations. And it also means that the design obligations is based less on what we see as a traditional specification and will usually include fitness for purpose obligations. So if we move to the next slide, based on what I've just said, while you can use EPC contracts for almost everything, we usually see them being used for complex projects that involve some sort of processing, say waste to energy, suit or water treatment plants, oil and gas and energy projects. They are very common. They're widely used in many different forms in various industries, and sometimes they give rise to their own disputes. But looking at them in a bit more detail in terms of the pros and cons, I thought there were a couple of points which were worth highlighting. First of all, single point responsibility is very useful, but it does mean that the employer has less control over the design, and that sometimes means that the contractor will focus on cost savings that may affect quality and performance. And that can be a real issue when you're looking at the complex engineering project, which is built on the basis that it will deliver revenue and performance over, say, a 30-year period. The other point about it is that a lot of those projects involve evolving technology, very much new technology when we look at things like renewables, and sometimes the clients want the ability to change the design and update it as necessary without always it becoming a, a contractual issue and have a bit more flexibility. And the related point that comes with it is the risk premium that comes with a complete risk transfer. If contractors are asked to take on the full risk, quite often that means that the price will be higher or sometimes they will focus much more on recovery or possibly both. So there is a cost to having that certainty for the client and we now tend to see that not all contractors are willing to take such a risk transfer in any event. And we're going to look at it when we look at how NEC can be used, but I thought I'd just say a few words about contractor selection first. You can have single or multi-stage tendering in the usual way. And what I tend to find in practice is that because quite often we're looking at a relatively small number of contractors with the necessary specialty experience and skills to deliver, Quite often you go through a multi-stage process, perhaps a small number of preferred bidders, further dialogue before a final decision is made. And I guess in that respect, the thing to bear in mind is that the technical ability should be regarding as playing much more of a role than simply the price. Now with NEC, we have early contractor involvement under option X22, something very much to be encouraged allows the contractor to be involved in the early design and improve delivery. That is quite often also a feature of EPC contracts because, as we've said, they are about complex design. So not surprisingly, they do it as well. Um, in the EPC world, they tend to be called um, feed contracts, front-end engineering and design. And usually there will be a separate contract that provides for that initial design before it moves on to the EPC contract stage. So bearing in mind the importance of design, um, I'll leave it to Peter to talk about design within NEC and APC contracts. Thank you, Shai. Um, yes, design. I'm gonna deal with design allocation, risk allocation, and see how we work with those. Design, well, you, if you know about the NEC, you'll know that we're pretty flexible in terms of how design is handled. You can really allow any level of design from nothing. The contractor just simply builds what the token rights want for two through to complete design reliability, which is really what an EPC contract is for. Just look at how this works in practice. Uh, 21.1, the contractor designs the parts of the works which the scope states the contractor is to design. So the scope is an important document. That's got to set out the performance requirements the contractor's design is to meet. Now, there could be some clients already done some level of design or specification of what it wants, and isn't leaving the contractor with a completely clean book to do what it likes. Um, those, the liability for that part needs to be clear as well. The contractor's design is to take on account of that part and take full responsibility for it. So there's a little bit of detail needed in terms of how you specify within the scope what's going to be the performance requirements. 
Shai's talked about multi-stage tendering and, and one of the issues that comes out is what, what information you get from the contractor at the stage of tender, how much information you get and what you expect to happen with that information. We've got a process in the contract of having um, scope for contractors design. If you're requiring the contractor to give you information saying this is what he's going to provide uh, and you want that to be something firm, then that becomes scope for the contractor's design and it becomes fixed and binding on the contractor. It can only be changed by an instruction of the project manager. And the project manager is only going to instruct that change if it's something which actually improves the thing from the point of view of the client. So we have this process of getting design proposals of some level at time of tender, if that's what you want. And by binding them into the contract data, they can be fixed on the contractor. Other information you may get and you may decide you, you, you want the information to give you some level of reassurance, um, but it's not really starting to fix on the design. So that can be left separately. Now the next point on design is that if you've got um, design carried out during the contract, the contractor's going to submit some details of that to the client and or the project manager actually, and get that agreed. So 21.2 deals with that by requiring submission of a particular design as the scope requires the set to the project manager for acceptance. So again, the scope is there to set out what it is you want submitted. Now, it may be that for an EPC contract, you've got some very clear ideas as to which bits of design are, are really crucially important to how the thing works and others are a, a, a matter of detail that can be left to the contractor. So. You could specify which parts of design you want, what level of information you want, how you want that submitted, when it's to be submitted, and what the process is for accepting that design, how that's going to be handled. So the whole of this needs to be set out in the scope. And this gives you the gain. It's a flexibility point. You can specify exactly what you need for this particular contract. And, and Shai has mentioned that it's mainly used for more complex projects, which is great because you've then got specialists helping to prepare this, but you can also be using it for simpler projects and there you need to be clear in the scope as to what it is you're looking to get from the contractor by way of design details so that you can say yeah i'm happy with it now once you've accepted that design the contractor still retain, retains responsibility there's no there's no transfer of liability for that design in acceptance and also you need to bear in mind that having gone through that process having got a design submission accepting the design the contractor is free under the NEC to come back later and say, look, I've changed my mind. I want to do a different design. This is the design I'm now proposing. Can you agree it? Uh, contractor is allowed to do that. And the only grounds for rejecting it would be that it doesn't comply with the scope. So scope, again, quite crucial. You'll see it's fundamentally important to how you deal with the, with the design allocation. So moving on to risk allocation, there's, there's a number of ways where, risk is allocated in the contract and dealt with. Um, selection of main and secondary options. Main options, Shai is going to go through that in a moment, the payment option as to how you do that. But there's a load of secondary options as well, which will fix this risk allocation. For example, is there, um, how is inflation to be dealt with? Is that a contracted liability or are you expecting to give some kind of update to deal with that? Um, changing the law of the country. If, if, a, if a legal requirements make it more complex, more expensive to do the work, who's carrying that risk? Um, limit of liability. Is the contracted liability unlimited or is there some limit? So there are a number of secondary options you need to look at to see how the risk allocation is handled. Now, the big one, of course, is compensation events. And there's a whole host of compensation events, which frightens people when they think about EPC contracts. We don't want any of this. Uh, but I look at it very simply. There's three elements to look at with compensation events. Number one, the clients change their mind. Well, that is a problem with any contract, EPC or otherwise, that is likely to result in cost. It's amazing how whatever change you make, it always costs more money than, than leaving it as it is, no matter how simple you're making it. So the whole point about an EPC contract is that you should aim to have minimal client involvement, minimal need for change. If you do have a large need for change, then you think very, need to think very seriously about how your contract should be structured. Because if you're going to make a lot of changes, there's a lot of work to be doing in terms of how you assess the consequence of them. So that's the first part. Now, the second one is failure of the client or others to act. 
well, the client should have minimal involvement. Um, we don't want a contract where the client is, or the project manager on their behalf, is interfering with doing all sorts of things and stopping things and starting them and providing information late and whatever. There should be minimal involvement with an EPC contract. So there should be very few events of that nature. Unforeseen, unforeseen events is the big one. Um, two major ones, obviously, are unforeseen ground conditions and weather events. Weather events are very simple. You, you, you are identifying contract data, the weather measurements that you're saying, well, we will take this risk. And other, all other weather, weather risks are with the contractor. Ground conditions, more and more complex. There's two ways of dealing with the, with the unforeseen ground conditions. Assuming you want to take greater risk to the contractor, which most EPC contracts will do, you can either delete the entire compensation event, which means that whatever the ground conditions are, it's 100% contractor's risk, or you can try and define some kind of ground definition, ground uh, status, which says, if it's of this nature, it's the contractor's risk. If it's outside of that area, then it's the client's risk. So that's the way of dealing with it. And that could often be done through what we call an option Z, a new clause written to the contract under the option which provides for client-specific clauses to deal with changes to the contract. Um, be cautious when you're writing option Z clauses to try and transfer risk allocation because it's so easy to write a clause which actually makes a mistake of interfering with some other part of the contract you hadn't realized was, was connected to it. Final one to deal with under risk allegation is liability for damage or injury. This is covered in full by section eight of the contract. Basically, it means that if the contractor causes damage or injury, it's the contractor's responsibility and liability. Um, if the client does it, it's the client's re responsibility. But there's other a couple of ones which are uh, of the nature of just, just happening. One, ones are the usual war, riot, uh, and such like, radi radiation, those, those are specified in the contract as client risk. You need to think about whether that should stay there. And also the inevitable consequence of the works. That, again, is client risk. And it's difficult to see how you can avoid that one if, in fact, it's going to cause serious damage to somebody because you're going to do this work. Um, short of specifying that damage in advance, it's difficult to see how the contractor could take such a risk. But anyway, those are the risk allocations. You need to look very carefully about how the NEC deals with it and seeing how it fits with what you're looking for on, on this element. OK, we talked about the risk allocation main option. Um, over to you, Shai, to deal with the payment side. Thank you. And payment and money obviously is a big part of risk allocation. And as I've mentioned before, the traditional EPC approach is fixed price lump sum contracts on the basis that it provides certainty and it is seen as more acceptable to funders. And if that's the approach that you want to take, then NEC obviously allows for that. This is done through option A with the activity schedule and payments are being made once activities are completed. But bearing in mind the issues with um, having a fixed price and the risk transfer approach that I've mentioned before, I think it's important to understand that NEC does provide a very useful alternative um, by using a target cost contract, option C. This allows a sharing of the risk which means that the risk premium is lower to start with because the client is not paying for risks that don't materialize. But also, probably more importantly, it acts as an incentive for better delivery because the commercial interests of both parties are aligned. They will both benefit from cost savings. So it creates the better environment, a bit more collaboration, which should improve delivery. When we look at target contracts, um, I always think there's a couple of points to note. First of all, it's a bit of an obvious point, but the target has to be realistic. It has to be a target that is achievable, that reflects the real cost of the works, because if the target is too low, for example, then at the start there is already a focus on recovery and that does not result in the joint incentive to collaboration and the alignment of commercial interests. And in addition, um, I tend to think that the way the risk share is structured should be kept relatively simple and that overcomplication should be avoided. And we see sometimes people who create very complex structures based on different levels, different share percentages, depending on how much the cost is um, exceeded or the savings. 
And sometimes that creates a bit less clarity as to how payment is being made. So my approach tends to be keep it relatively simple. But of course, NEC is not just about target cost and recognizing that ultimately the commercial incentives drive performance. There are a few other options that can be put in place in order to create what I tend to think of as a more sophisticated approach to incentives. Um, and that includes, first of all, option X6, bonus for early completion. Um, clients tend to focus more on the stick, about the delay damages for delay, but sometimes I think there's a bit less of uh, consideration given to the carrot and possibly having a bonus for early completion. What we also have, which is very useful for EPC contracts, is option X17, low performance damages. And this is to do with defects in the works, which are identified in the defect certificate, and is, in a way, another form of liquidated damages when the works do not deliver the performance that is specified and required. And that's why it is very relevant when we're looking at things like an output certification and where poor performance affects the commercial revenue that the works are generated. It can sometimes be difficult to prove losses and this operates as an incentive to assure that the contractor does as much as they can to improve performance. Now, it's not all about um, negative incentives and options X20 key performance indicators allows for them to be used together with an incentive schedule. And this is done against what the contractor reports about performance. And when the KPIs are achieved, there is additional payment. And again, it seems to me this is very useful when you're looking at complex output requirements. And it is yet another way to incentivize a contractor because if they can improve performance, they can also have a share and have a benefit from the improved revenue that perhaps the client is generating. And then the final one that I wanted to talk about is option X21, whole life costing. And this is about proposals which are being made at the construction stage that will reduce the cost of operating and maintaining an asset. And when you think about it, when you're looking at an EPC contract, who quite often will be then operated over at least 25 to 30 years, you can see that quite often a small investment during the construction stage can result in very substantial savings over the full contract period and will improve commercial performance, which will improve revenue being received. So from my perspective, it's difficult for me to see why a client would not want to encourage a contractor to put forward such proposals and on the basis that the contractor will be rewarded if such proposals are effective and can generate all life savings. So this is a bit of the money approach to everything. And I'm gonna hand over to Peter to talk about time. Time management, how do you manage time? What, how important is time on an EPC contract? Um, basically, it's, if you're looking at a turnkey contract, um, the, 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 the extreme view is that the client hands over the document to the contractor and then a couple of three years later comes back, um, collects the key off the contractor, opens the door and says, yeah, that's okay, fine, thank you. Um, but of course, it's, it's not like that at all. It, it, um, there, is, there is a interface in between that period, in between that start and end. Now, NEC uses this program as a management tool. It's not a claims tool, it's a management tool. So it's there to help both the contractor and client. Um, it, it, it allows flexibility in how you're using it. Um, project manager gets involved in it, and we need to recognize that in many respects, in, in, certainly in terms of time, the, the project manager is looking to see, well, this is what the client's looking to do. I need to keep an eye on how things are going. Is the client's objective being achieved? If not, why not? So think about what the program is there for. Um, it's there so that the contractor can demonstrate how, he's, how it's going to do the work and or plan the work itself, how the work's carried out. And it's there so the client knows what's going on, which helps to give confidence in uh, the completion that we are expecting to have the job done. Uh, program shows it's all on time, everything's going okay. But it also lets the client know of things which need the client's involvement. So the project manager will flag it up that um, the contract, the client needs to do this particular action by this date in order to meet the program. And that can be taken place. So you need the program for that. And also we use it in um, such things as assessing compensation events if they do occur. 
and also to plug in up um, early warning needing. So there's a whole range of uses for the programme in an EPC contract, which will apply just the same as any other contract. Now, the way this is handled is that there's a programme provided, possibly at tender, if not um, in a specified period afterwards, so the client and contractor uh, on one mind both know what's going to be doing, what's going to be happening. We could specify a frequency of updates. Now, people start to think about this, oh, well, I'll have a monthly update. You may not need it. Um, you may not need a monthly update. Think about it. What, what do you need? Is it quarterly, even six monthly? You might not need that. In fact, the way that it could be run is without bothering too much on updates, simply relying on the project manager, keeping aware of it and identifying the need for a change. If the progress is so substantially different from what the program shows, then there's a need for a new program. Pro the project manager then prods the contractor to provide one. So you can get a program whenever it's needed without actually having a, a, a regular update, which may be un not unnecessary. If the work is going according to plan, we don't really need a new program. It's not that important. But as long as you have a program and it's an accepted program and it's roughly pretty well complying with what is intended for the future, you've got the information you need to run that and to manage time under the EPC contract. What we need to recognise is that the flexibility given by the contract in terms of how the programme is used and provided allows you to tailor the, it, your requirements precisely to meet the needs of this particular EPC contract that you're running. OK, over to you, uh, Shai, to deal with uh, defects and testing. Yeah, thank you. Well, as Peter said, um, some APC contracts can be relatively simple and straightforward, and NEC has quite a comprehensive regime for quality and defects that will manage that. But if we're looking more at um, the more complex projects where there is more process plants being used, then what we tend to see is that it has to be a lot of testing of the various equipment that has to be installed. And it will depend on the nature of each project, whether you're putting in boilers, pumps, or turbines, for example. But what we find is that this results in a much more detailed regime for tests. And sometimes it starts from the supplier's factory, but then you'll also have quite detailed plans for tests before and after completion. You look at things like um, acceptance tests, reliability tests, the period over which to take over. They usually allow for a ramp up period. They're designed to test the plant at maximum capacity. So they have to perform almost as well. So that is quite important. It will usually be set up in the scope. But I guess the other point to mention is, and when Peter was speaking about the program, that these are the sort of uh, activities that you need to make sure are included in the program and are properly detailed out so that the client has a full understanding of how the commissioning process is going on and how the testing is progressing. And I've said it has to be in the scope. I have seen examples where the Z option clauses are used in order to deal with testing or commissioning. It's usually done more as a high level principle rather than provide all the detail. And I think it's done as a way to highlight the importance of that stage, but also sometimes to cover how it may relate to takeover or completion. The other things that we tend to see um, in relation to EPC contract is that there's much more of a provision for things like spur parts to be available, especially if the plant is over a, operated over a long period of, say, 30 years or so. And the other thing that is perhaps sometimes a bit different is that the role of warranties from um, the equipment suppliers is also quite important where you're looking at bits of um, complex engineering. The other key issue to think about when you're looking at this is that quite often this will require client cooperation or possibly cooperation from other parties because uh, you will need the client to deliver, say, the waste or the fuel that has to be used in order to carry out the commissioning process. And if you're also looking at the operator's role who will take over the plant following completion, they sometimes get involved. So there's a bit of an interface question and where it is dependent on a third party or the client, as Peter said before, that's the sort of thing that you would put in the program so that everybody has clarity as to when that is required and the effect of um, it not being delivered on completion. 
And then I thought I'll mention um, very briefly another version of EPC, which is what we call EPCO, which is where the contractor it continues to operate the plant after construction. This does require a bit of thought about how the payments are structured. There can sometimes be interface issues, but if you're looking to do that, then the NEC4 design and build option is very suitable. And, and sometimes it is just used as a separate O&M contract. But then moving on to the final topic that we're looking to cover, which is the EPCM option, yet another variation. All we've done is add an M, but it's actually very different. It is in simple terms, the opposite of what an EPC contract is all about, which is about a full transfer of risk and a fixed price. And I've mentioned before some of the issues with traditional EPC, and in simple terms, what we find now is that some contractors are not willing to accept the high risk transfer. And in some industries, there is a relatively small pool of specialist contractors who can deliver the required project. And as I've said, they're less willing to accept the risk transfer and to operate on that basis. And on the other side, what we see is that clients want to have more control over the design. They also sometimes want to have more control over the commercial issues. And that's especially, especially the issue when we're looking at things like evolving technologies. Um, and I've mentioned before, it's a big thing in renewables. And if clients want to feel comfortable that over a long construction period, they can make the necessary changes to update what is being built, perhaps to improve it, then this is something to look at. And we see in the market that there is a growing interest. And um, just for example, in April this year, I can be published the Blue Book, which is their version of an EPCM contract. Um, so how does it work in practice? In very simple terms, the contractor is appointed, but not to effectively design and construct, but to manage the works. Quite often, this will be done under a professional services contract. Sometimes they will provide some of the design and engineering services, but quite often they will appoint a consultant to provide that. And what they will do is they will be in charge of procuring different contracts, usually using the ECC form of contract on behalf of the client, but they will not be a party to that contract. And in simple terms, they will manage the construction process for the client. They will deal, for example, with coordination, interfaces, payment, and all of those issues. And that's how the project will operate. And as you can see, this is very, very different from what Peter described as the client telling the contractor, I want to come in two years' time, get the key, and be able to switch on the plant. If you look at NEC, um, that's the sort of situation where you can use X12, uh, which is multi-party collaboration, and a slightly different variation is using, using option F management contracting. So looking at it in a bit more detail, if we move next and look at some of the benefits, well, there should be a lower cost to this option because there is no risk premium and the client is able to negotiate directly with each party in the supply chain. It could be quicker if the client wants to start early. The procurement should be faster because you don't have to set up the entire contract and sometimes get funding before you can start construction. And as I've said before, there's much more control by the client in terms of the design, the construction process, which hopefully can lead to better quality and makes it a lot easier to manage change. And in terms of the funding model, uh, because the client is entering into smaller contracts with each member of the supply chain, rather than one big EPC contract, then we sometimes, we tend to look less at um, project finance structures. But one other benefit of this is that the insolvency of poor risk performance is spread because rather than rely on a single contractor, you're spreading the risk over a large number of contractors. Um, it's not all that isn't great. Um, it can be less easy to fund than, than traditional EPC contracts. It does require a lot more management by the client, um, which means investing in resources, 
having the knowledge to manage those kind of projects. And of course, the client does not get the single point responsibility. And sometimes that's an issue when you're looking at interfaces. And as I've said before, it really does depend on what you're trying to achieve with your project, how much control, what sort of risk allocation you, you want to have. And so hopefully all of this um, gives you an, a bit of an idea of when EPCM is suitable and when you may use it, but also more broadly, how EPC contracts work, some of the benefits of using NEC for such projects. And I think from now on, Peter and I are happy to take some questions and discuss it in a bit more detail. Thank you, Shai. We've got a number of questions um, already on the screen, so I, I, I hope people have put in. Um, one question there, how much design can you expect from the bidders at the tender stage? Um, yeah, I think if you, to expect somebody to get a, a really detailed design is a bit extreme. It means that tendering costs, bidding costs are, are pretty massive, um, and therefore there needs to be a limit to it. But I guess it's a question of a balance. How much design do you need to have confidence that the contractor you're about to appoint um, is going to provide you with what you've asked for? Um, Shai, your experience in terms of that, do you get do you, do you, do, you, do you get a lot of information? Um, it's I agree with you, Peter. It's not a lot of information, but it's also the nature of the information, um, and that's where it is different from designer built. Um, I guess because it is a full risk transfer, and because we're looking much more at an output specification rather than the client doing, say, an initial design, which is to be developed and completed by the contractor, what the client provides are, well, some of the basic constraints, the size of the site, that affects design, and there's not much you can do about it, but it's much more about the output, what the client is trying to achieve in terms of um, how much waste will be processed, um, how much water will be treated, the amount of energy that the plant is supposed to generate, and then the idea is that the APC contractor is very much left to their own devices as to how they deliver that output. Okay. Um, there's a few questions on target cost. Um, would invest investors be comfortable with a target price contract? Should the target cost be agreed? And then could it, how, how simple should it be in terms of the share? So, I mean, first part, how... Do you think that target cost is feasible for um, funders to uh, work on? Your thoughts? Um, from my experience, um, currently it is a bit of a challenge. Um, it goes very much against the traditional approach of looking for certainty of a fixed fee. Um, but having said that, um, I'm aware of at least one substantial project where it is being looked at. And I think funders are becoming more sophisticated and they recognize that for some very high value complex projects, uh, the risk premium of a fixed price just means it's not value for money. Um, and the only way to get value for money is to share the risk to an extent. Um, it's, it's an involving process. It is still something which is quite new to funders. But I can tell they are starting to look at it and they're starting to understand the benefits of taking an approach as opposed to fixed fee. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of questions. Uh, can X17 apply to other elements of the work that are not defect? Well, X6, X17 is states as being this is what you pay if you've got a defect in the defect certificate. So it can't directly be applied. No, you need to write another provision if you want to deal with something. Um, payment for things there's nothing wrong with it but you want some recovery of money i'm not no i think that's um that, that's a slightly different issue you need to write a clause to cover that um another simple question how are extensions of time dealt with under the contract would that be through the ce process indeed yes that's um, the only way of dealing with the charm changes through the compensation event um it doesn't change with an epc contract um Testing, should the contractor be asked for a commissioning plan as part of the scope? Your thoughts on that, Shai? Do you, do you, need, do you need to know that much detail about it at, at that stage? Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, th th this is the, the testing commission should definitely be within the scope rather than something that is being developed later. Um, because this is how the client ultimately 
um, identifies what they want the plant to deliver, the, the EPC conduct to be. Um, and that's where it very much depends on the nature of the project. If it is a very simple one, then testing and commissioning will be limited. If it is a very complex process plant, then this, as I've said before, will be quite a detailed process with timing regime. Um, it will list loss of different kinds of tests. So it's the sort of thing you want to have certainty from day one, as opposed to hoping to develop it as the corner goes along and reach agreement towards the end. Okay. A couple of the questioners are saying, what, is, is there a difference between EPCM and a construction management approach? Is it the same thing? Um, yes, um, for people who are used, um, construction management sometimes is used in the building industry. Um, and yes, in terms of the contractual structure, the simple point is that instead of a single contract with the main contractor, um, there are lots of contracts with the various parties within the supply chain, together with the management contract with the contractor, but the contractor is responsible for managing the various contracts, interfaces, um, rather than actually constructing and delivering the works. Um, a question there, can you include X29 in the EP, EPC contract? And I think the answer is yes. Um, yeah. No reals me, why not? It just, it's, it's another thing that you want the contractor to make sure that they're looking to improve things. Um, look into the other questions. Under EPCM, what's the responsibility and risks the contractor needs to take? Um, not sure on that one. Well, uh, uh, I guess the, the simple answer is it's a very different kind of risk from EPC. Um, and, and the risk the risk of the contractor who is responsible for managing will effectively the same risk as you take under any professional services contract. <laughs> They're responsible for ensuring that um, they do a good job in coordinating and management. And then what you'll probably have is a, possibly a different risk profile for each of the supply chain um, parties. And in some of them, if some of them are providing the design, then again, that will be under professional services contract and it will be the usual design requirements that you expect, but it might change depending how it's managed. And if it's the people who are constructing the civil works, for example, that will be a bit different from the people who are providing um, the parts of plant and machinery, for example. Okay. Um, there's a question here in relation to the new. EPCM contract, well, does this contract remove the project manager role? Does the contractor effectively take on this role in relation to the contracts with the client's supply chain? Um, I'm not sure what, what, what the project manager will still exist if you're using the ECC contract. Um, and if you're providing a professional services contract for the main contractor on EPCM, then that will be a service manager role involved in that. But I think that the project manager and service manager will have a, a very close link with what the client is doing and what the client is looking for in terms of how it manages it. Your thoughts on this, Jay? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And in simple terms, I mean, when you appoint a project manager under a normal ECC contract, then you would use a professional services contract. Um, and, and in a way, yes, the construction manager will be in effective terms doing what the project manager would be doing. Thank you. And they would have their own contract with, with, with the service manager in that one. So it's, it's a nice little circular thing. Um, question here, Shai, you men mentioned the benefits of EPCM. What are the disadvantages? I think you've touched on some of those. There. We, we touched on it to an extent. Um, yes, the, the, the benefit of a turnkey concept is a spitter set. You just turn on once it's ready and you should be able to press a button and it all starts working. Um, and there's less involvement and you're relying completely and passing all the risk to the contractor. EPCM is the opposite um, in the sense that the client very much needs to stay involved in the project. Um, obviously, there's a large degree of reliance on the construction manager, um, but you can't have the hands-off approach that you would with EPC. And in terms of risk and management, with an EPC contract, if something goes wrong, then there's single point responsibility and you go after the contractor under a single contract. 
um, the interface issues when you're using many members of the supply chain, each one under their own contract, is that sometimes um, if something does not work, if there's a defect, it is difficult to identify the precise reason. Um, one party may blame another party. It might be due to poor coordination. So it makes it more difficult for the client to manage risk if something does not go right. But um, that has to be weighed against the benefits of possibly better cost and change control um, and being able to start early. So as I've said, it's a question of what works best on each project and what the client is trying to achieve. Um, question mark here about uh, some equipment failing. How much can the contractor rely on reasonableness in cases where the equipment fails close to the amount of hours required for testing and approval, considering the liability and the defects liability period? Um, not quite sure I fully understand, but it looks as though they're saying that there's, there's, something has failed, but it's very close to what it should have been. Um, can you? Can is there a reasonableness test, which means that's okay? <laughs> um. It's an interesting question. Um, generally, uh, people are expected to comply with the performance requirements. Um, and the fact that perhaps it is just a few percentage points off what is required, um, I think it probably will be difficult to argue that that should be regarded as having achieved the acceptance tests. Um, in practice, it tends to be a technical question because the follow-on question can sometimes be, what are the consequences of failing to achieve it? Um, and if the client can demonstrate that it, while it might seem as a very small difference, it has serious consequences, that makes a difference. And um, if it does not have real consequences, then you might try to argue about reasonableness. You might try to rely on um, the obligation to act in a speech of mutual trust and cooperation. But I think it is better and safer to assume that if a certain performance criteria is specified, then that's the one that needs to be achieved. Yeah. But we do have in the contract a process for accepting a defect. Um, mm -hmm. If it's close enough to be, okay, we can live with it, it's going to cost me a bit of extra money because it's not performing quite as well as we expect. Then if, Mr. Contractor, you agree to pay me this amount of money, I'll accept the defect. So there's a process for dealing with that if it's close um, which is not simply saying, oh, it's reasonable, not, not, we, we shan't worry about it. Um, we just agree a price or a payment or whatever it is to avoid the need to try and correct it. Um, I, I think there's a few questions about target price contracts. Yep. And both of them kind of seem to refer to 100% um, contractor pain share. <laughs> 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 and whether that is in effect a guaranteed maximum price. And yes, I mean, the point of a target cost contract is to have some sharing of the risk. And if the way you structure it is by putting all the risk on the contractor, then obviously I don't think it can be seen as a genuine target cost contract with a risk share, um, which means you won't get the benefits of having that payment process. Yeah, it's a very different contract then, I think. It's a fixed price contract with some mechanism for the client being paid um, extra money from the contractor if, he, if the contractor makes some saving. It's a, it's a, it's a strange contract when you've got a, a, a cap on, on that. But anyway, um, so where we go? Where are we now? Let's look at other questions. Are there budget constraints in deciding when an NEC contract is to be used? What are the useful, useful references or documents to understand NEC contract examples in concise um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that NEC contract, um, any contract that will, will be affected by what the budget is, how you handle it and what you're going to do, how you manage it and which contract you choose. But I don't think you, you, you decide whether or not to use an NEC contract as opposed to some other form of contract simply on budget requirements. You just need to adjust the contract choice within the family to deal with your, your, your budgetary constraints. Um, yeah. um, I think there's a question about um, EPCM, contract management, as compared to option F, um, which is management contracting. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's, that's always a bit confusing. So the way to think about it, 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 in practical terms, it's quite similar, but contractually it is different because under construction management, 
as I've said, the client will enter into direct contracts with the various members of the supply chain, as well as a contract with the contractor who manages everything. Under management contracting, the client will enter into a contract with the contractor who manages everything, but then it's the contractor who will enter into the various contracts with the members of the supply chain. And some people might think, well, that's very similar to traditional main contracting, but the difference is that the role of the main contractor is effectively to manage the process. Uh, and the common position is that they are in effect paid a fee on the costs from the various members of the supply chain, which then flow up to the client. So I can see that in practical terms, it's quite similar, but it's very different in terms of the contractual structure. Question here on two-stage tendering. Can we, does two-stage tendering work? Stage one for contractor prepared detail design before moving to stage two construction. Well, I think uh, uh, Shai touched on that one using the ECI option in the contract, or indeed you can you can have a completely separate, two separate prices, um, a tender price for one, and then agree a price as a new contract for the one. So yes, it can be done quite readily and there's two different ways of dealing with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Um, under Act 21, it, in whole life cost, is decommissioning cost of the project included? Well, it can be, yes. Um, if you're looking at whole life cost, then the cost of demolishing it is part of your whole life. So, yes, that's all part of the process. It, whole life means what you're going to spend over the life of the project, including closing it down and whatever happens then. Yeah, no, it, it's a very good point. Um, and it's addressed also in X29 that we mentioned before which is about climate change. And the point about X29 is that you are looking at the overall life of the assets, not just the construction costs, and it specifically refers to demolition at the end of the project. <laughs> okay, a leading question here, what makes NEC better than a JCT contract, in your opinion? <laughs> um, no, it, How much it, time do we have? Yes. <laughs> Leaving other, side, other considerations aside, I mean, basically the JCT is not, not created for major infrastructure projects. It's been designed for building projects and it, it's um, maybe if you've got some kind of big EPC contract, a JCT might work with it. I've never looked to see how it might work, um, but at least the NEC, what we're saying is that it's been designed for infrastructure projects of this nature and therefore it's quite suitable. So I think rather than getting into a slanging match as to which is the better contract, just recognize where we are with this one. Yes, as I've said, the, the real question is what what project are you looking to deliver? How are you looking at the risk allocation? And then you choose the contract. You don't sort of choose the contract first and then try to fit your project for the specific contract. Yeah. Um, quick one here. Once in contract, can the client stop the work due to health and safety concerns? Yes. Yes. You can suspend, you can suspend yeah. That should be a feature of every contract. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you add in X clauses once the contract's been agreed? Uh, yes, if the contractor agrees. You can add in what you like if the contractor agrees. Uh, clause 12 specifically provides for amending the contract yeah. once it's been entered into. Yeah, 12.3 yeah. allows you to, you know, both parties have to agree, but just like any contract, by agreement, you can vary it at a later stage. Ah, what for you here, Shai? If Using EPCM, uh, how do you deal with the design works if the same if the designer is also acting as the construction manager? Well, I'm I'm not sure what is driving it. The construction manager, if they are delivering the design, um, they'll just deal with that as a separate role, uh, and. In practice, what will happen, because it's never a, a single individual, there are big organizations, there will be part of that organization that will be in charge of the design, and there's likely to be a very different part of that organization, which is in charge of the management. Um, and in terms of the client, they will take the risks of those two very different functions uh, as part of the service they deliver. Okay. Um, I'm going to say the last last question, really, because we're just about out of time. Um, uh, 
is there scope for liability if the whole life cost is not met following operation by the client after the defect date? Um, I, I guess the <laughs> question is, I, I mean, the way you look at whole life cost in the proposals, in, in a way, it, it usually will be in terms of the design. So if the contractor says, um, we've got a proposal to change the design, and it will deliver whole life costing, um, or to use a different piece of equipment, the way it will be implemented, it will be through an instruction. Um, and then it depends on the nature of the instruction, whether it's design or supply equipment. And if, for example, the idea is that you are using a different piece of equipment, which is more expensive, but meant to last for longer, then ultimately it will be like other contractual obligations once implemented. Um, and goes back to my earlier point about having warranties from equipment supplies, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, one very last quick one I'll deal with. Um, if you select X22, are you entering into a contract for the full scope of works without knowing the price of the construction at the point of award? Um, the answer is yes, but yeah. um, subject to the right to end the contract at the end of stage one without paying compensation. So you can always decide not to go ahead with stage two if you don't like the price or other, other aspects don't work. Okay, I think we're going to close there. We've now run out of time. Just a very quick uh, reminder about the NEC Community app. I'm not sure if you've already got it on your mobiles. If not, put it on the mobile. It allows you to get all sorts of information about NEC, getting people together, listening to what other people are saying, sharing practice, uh, getting contacts through to, this, um, to podcasts and such like. So a useful bit of stuff on your mobile compared with some of the other rubbish we've all got on our mobiles now. So anyway, thank you very much for attendance and the questions. Very, very helpful. We'll look and see whether there's any more questions we need to answer. We can give useful answers to separately and circulate those. Now, I believe that the um, slides and the recording will be available in due course. Is that right, Farhan? Yes. Yes. So yeah. they'll be available to you to um, review and look again at some later stage. So thank you for attending and goodbye. Thank you both, Peter and Shai, for hosting as well. Um, and yeah, thank you.